that Jesus has no power over it. He has absolute power over everything that we are going through. He has been there. So he cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He has been there. He knows it. Because of that, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is important. Mercy and grace. These are the two things that proceed out of the, 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 the throne of God. These are the two things that proceed out of the throne of Almighty God. Mercy and grace. And the believer needs it to fulfill his assignment over here. We need mercy and we need grace of God. I have explained mercy and grace before, but let me repeat myself. Why do we need mercy? Mercy is forgiveness. Mercy is forgiveness. If we say we have not sinned against God, we make God a liar. We sin against God, we sin against man, we sin constantly sinning. And we need the mercies of God. A clear example is the one that I'm always given. Mercy will be you are in a situation that is meant for you to fall. And you are struggling, struggling, struggling. You don't call upon them in the, you know, all the mercies of the living God or the grace of God to come and help you. And you fall. Now that you fell, you are feeling the heat of your fall. So you are probably moving limping because instead of calling for help before you fall, you did not. And now you are moving forth, you know, instead of, okay, clear example is this. Let's say you see somebody climbing a mountain. And as he's climbing this mountain, he holds on something, a little branch. And it is not holding him. So he sees himself coming down. This is the time to call upon the Lord. You did not. And you fell. God did not allow Satan to kill you. And matter of fact, the goodness of God made it possible for you to be taken to the hospital by an ambulance that was passing by in the mountains. And the Lord released you into the hand of one of his agents in the hospital over there, a doctor who believes in God and worked on you. So as a result of that, instead of you being crippled, you are not. You still can walk, but this time, limping. Glory be to God. The grace of God, which will be totally the opposite, will be that by the time that you are hanging in there, you know that you are going to fall. You call upon God. Please, Jesus, son of David, help me. And the little branch that you know will not hold you. Suddenly, that branch has become something else. Strength has been given. And the branch is holding you tight. And matter of fact, an helicopter from nowhere saw you from afar. And they came and grabbed you. Did you break your leg? No. That is the grace of God. We call upon the grace before we fall. 
We don't fall and call upon the grace. When you fall and you are calling upon God, you are calling upon the message of Almighty God. Please, Lord, forgive me. We need grace more than the message of God. We said that Jesus is interceding for the believer for two things. Number one, reason why of reading this Hebrews 4.14 is because Jesus intercedes for the believer when he is tempted. When the believer is tempted. So, temptation which believers face are part of the content of Jesus Christ intercession or his intercessory ministry. Jesus is interceding for us so that whatever temptation that comes on our way, we come out. He has been there. The high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. For there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? Because Jesus Christ is standing on the right hand, sitting on the right hand of the Father and always praying for us. So whatever temptation that the believer will go through, prayer has been delivered already. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful. This is why what will kill others that do not believe in God, when it comes on you, it is only going to strengthen you. You will come out and give a testimony of what the Lord has done for you. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. Every plan of the devil against your life will not succeed in the name of Jesus Christ. It will not. This is why it will not. The man in authority is standing and praying for you. Praying for you. The second objective of Christ's intercession for the believer it is for the work of purity in the believer's life to become pure more and more like Jesus Christ prays for us so that we will not be contaminated by sin that is So in Hebrews 10 and the verses 21 to 22. So we having the high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith. Having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Hallelujah. These are powerful scriptures. Powerful scriptures. So now, the John 14, one that we read before, Jesus said, Jesus Christ said, he said, you know, don't worry, don't be afraid. For in my father's house. He said, don't be afraid, but believe in God and believe also in me. For in my father's house are many mentions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I am coming to get you. So where I am, you will be there. Christ is not expecting us to die in the world. Christ is not expecting any of his children or his brethren, let me put it this way, to die here. We are on assignment and when your assignment is over, you will be taken back. But if your assignment is over before Jesus comes, you will be taken back. 
By the time that Jesus comes, if you are still in business, your assignment will definitely end by the time he comes for you. This is a good reason for a child of God to be living. The number three office that Jesus Christ will operate. Remember what I said before? I said Jesus occupies three offices. The first office is one that is already done when he came here. That is the office of a prophet. The second office that Christ is operating with is what he's doing right now. It is the office of priest. And the third office, which is to come, that is the office of the king. Hallelujah. So, knowing all this, we have such a wonderful and mighty hope. Serving God. God has not forgotten about you. Jesus Christ has not forgotten about you. Matter of fact, you are always in the mind of Christ. For the man is praying for you. So, whatsoever that you are going through, please, is just part of Christian life. The Lord will see you through. Your assignment will be accomplished. And victory, it is your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. I have come with a word of comfort this morning to let you know that hold fast your profession. Hold fast the faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord that is taking you from one degree of glory, a time comes that you are going to reign with Jesus Christ in his third office. May the Lord God bless you. Amen. Everyone is very welcome and we thank God for your lives. We thank God for grace. We have a word from the living God today that we titled, Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I will quickly say that love is a spiritual matter. So we're going to see that in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10, and the verse is 25 to 28 this is uh, a lawyer that came before jesus trying to trick jesus this is what he said he said master what shall i do to inherit eternal life master what shall i do to inherit eternal life and jesus said unto him what is written in the law how readest thou and the lawyer, he answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Jesus said unto the lawyer, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Hallelujah. So obeying the Lord brings forth life. Obeying the law brings forth life. Jesus said, if you obey the law, you will have eternal life. Because that is the question that the man asked. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him, what is the law? And he recited the law to Jesus. And Jesus said, you are right. Go and obey the law and you will inherit eternal life. So, these two laws are the most important laws because God himself said it. He said the first commandment is that you love God. The second commandment is that you love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, it is very, very easy for anyone to say, I love God. It is very easy, very easy to say, I love God. But loving a neighbor, it, it is something else. Hallelujah. So,
The man went ahead. He said, but uh, Jesus, loving God is okay for me. But loving the neighbor, who is my neighbor? You see, the trickiness of man's heart. If Jesus is saying, loving a neighbor, uh, loving a brother, loving a sister, uh, this question of who is my neighbor uh, might not even be having a place at all because uh, everyone that is outside you is your neighbor. So why the question, who is my neighbor? You see, there is something about us. He wants to know who he should love and who he should not love. Basically, that's what the man wants to know. Then Jesus, he himself asked it. He said, who is my neighbor? That is Mark, uh, Luke 10 and the verses 29. The man said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So I'm going to read from Luke 10, 29 to 37. Because Jesus is going to answer this question. Who is my neighbor? And it is not as foolish as this man's question might seem to be. Because... Very unfortunately, we seem human beings, we seem to love people that love us. And despise they that despise us. And we say, even God himself is like that. We justify ourselves by saying that God said, if you love me, I will love you. But let me tell you, God's love is not without, I mean, it, 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 it's not a conditional love. It's unconditional love. Either you love him or not, God still loves you. But man's love is not unconditional. Man's love is conditional. You only go and show love to them because they came to your funeral. When you had a funeral in your home, they came there. So this time that he is also taught, you are going there. But that one, let me look at the book. <laughs> this one, his name is not there. I'm not going there. It's as simple as this. Because when my father died, when my brother, when I lost someone, the man did not show up. So, you see, so th this is the reason why the question is, can I possibly love somebody who is not loving me? This is what the man is trying to find out. Tricking Jesus, right? Tricking Jesus. Jesus is going to answer the question, verse 30 of Luke 10. Jesus answering said to the man, let me give you a story. Then you will tell me who your neighbor is. He said, a certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. This thief, they stripped the man of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, we thank God, there came down a certain priest. Hallelujah. If a priest is coming to find out that you know, this stranger on his way, businessman, was attacked. He beated him, wounded him, left behind, almost dead. The first person that showed up to the scene, the Bible says that a certain what? Priest. So, pastor was the first one to show up. We thank God for pastor's life. Amen? So, by chance, pastor showed up that way. And when pastor saw the man, unfortunately, pastor passed by on the other side. He looked at the time. It was pretty much time for church message. So he said, if I attend to this man, I might be running out of time. So he passed by and ran quickly to come and deliver the message at the church. Amen. Thank you, my Lord. So, number two, verse 32 of Luke 10, he said, And likewise, a Levite, when he saw, when he was at the place, he came and looked on him <laughs> and passed him on the other side. The Levite, these are one of the tribes of the Israel, Israel 12 tribes. The Levites are the one in the Old Testament. These are the only ones that have access to the priesthood. God reserved this you know, tribe for himself. So we can also say that uh, the assistant pastor also came and find out that the man was half dead. And uh, he looked at it and said, ah, by this time, pastor must be at the church. 
I have to make sure that I join there. So the assistant pastor also passed by the other side. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for assistant pastor's life. But in verse 33 of Luke 10, he said, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Everyone say compassion. Compassion. Hallelujah. The Samaritans are the ones that, <laughs> is the last ones that any Jew will be looking onto. Because between the Samaritans and the Jews, there, there is what? No business. How do we know this? From the well, the well of Jacob, when Jesus Christ met that woman, you know, <laughs> in John 4, 24, that is the time that the woman was going to say, they said, hey, Jesus, but you are, you are a Jew. How come that you have regard to me as a Samaritan woman? Because between the Jews and the Samaritan, there is no business. Total enemies. There we go. A man, Samaritan, who's supposed to be an enemy to this man who is wounded. He's the one that had what is called compassion. Hallelujah. The man had compassion when he saw this man laying down on the floor. So, verse 34, he said, so he went to him, the Samaritan man went to the, the wounded man, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. I highlighted oil and wine. Say oil and wine. Oil and wine. Oil and wine meant to heal the man's wound. Hallelujah. Let me say this straight away because the, the outpouring of the oil and the wine is symbolized the Holy Spirit one way or another. Hallelujah. We thank God. So, he poured the oil and wine to heal his wound. And, and, and then what he did, he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn. So, he took him to the car and brought him find a, a, a hotel around the corner and then pay for the hotel. We are going to see that he paid for it. So, he took care of that man. And the morrow, the following day, when he departed, Oh, wow. Look at this. So he took care of the man, and on the morrow, when he departed, so the man stayed there. He didn't just leave the man, the wounded man, right away. He actually spent the night right there. So the following day, the following day, when he took him to the hotel, he also checked a room for himself. He stayed there, watched over the man, and then the following day, what happened here? Then the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pairs and gave trying to answer this man who asked him, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus returned the question back to the man. He said, which now of these three, between the pastor, the assistant pastor, and then the Samaritan, thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Hallelujah. And the man, the lawyer, who was tricking Jesus, he himself said, he that showeth mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. Hallelujah. Go and hey, this is uh, another from the very beginning Jesus said that you, you know the law. Go and do it. The man said, I know the law. I'm not ready. Uh, that is why he brought forward the question. Who is my neighbor? Jesus narrated all this story. And at the end of it he told him exactly the same thing. Go 
and do the same thing. Go and do the same thing. So who is your neighbor? We are talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. So if you are here and you are asking yourself, who is your neighbor? The same answer applies to you. If you are here and you are asking yourself, who is your neighbor? The same answer applies to you. Hallelujah. The craftiness of man is this. It is seen here, the hypocrisy of human nature. That Jesus Christ did not fall into that trap. Because this lawyer, uh, meaning that uh, someone who knows the word of God, he had studied and he knows. That is why he brought forth such a question. But it wasn't, it wasn't about knowledge. About, it was about the human nature that was coming out. A higher level of what God is about to do in these people's life who have been operating with the Old Testament all the time under the law of Moses. But Jesus Christ, in John 1, 17, he said the law was given to Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. We have seen it. One of the greatest elements in grace is compassion. Is compassion. And compassion is what triggered the Samaritan man to have mercy on the wounded man. Compassion. Compassion. When we talk about love, without that element, it would take the grace of God and, uh, and an element in the grace of God called compassion from one to, to love. It would take the grace of God and an element in grace called compassion to love someone. That is, that is the agape type of love. A love without condition. A, a love without any strength attached. A love that is projected from within. Not what has been seen, not what you have seen of the person that is bringing forth love, but something that proceeded from within you. Do you know that most of the time we look unto others and we try to get love from them? But love is not from them. Love is from within. It's from within. This is all that Jesus Christ is trying to bring out. And all of us, let's try and come in line with that. So now, in 1 John chapter 4, the verses 20 and 21. This is what the word of God says about love. He said, if a man say, I love God and hate his brother, a man says he loved God but he hated his brother, he is a liar. He, period. He is a liar. For he that loveth not his, bro his brother whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he had not seen? That's what I said. It is very easy to say, I love God. Very, very easy. How is one going to verify? It can be verified by your relationship to people. It can be verified by your relationship to people. Moving around and, pro, you know, hey, pastor, pastor, pastor seeing the wounded man and pastor is busy because congregation is waiting. The love of God was not expressed. But he said that I am moving in the grace of God. I am moving by the grace of God, but there This one is not as difficult as we might think. It is very simple. Simple to understand that either you love God or you love yourself or you love doing what is right in the sight of your own perspective. In other words, as people love you, so you love them. And you are not loving. Jesus said, I love your enemies. Uh, so that the enemies might also love you. I don't know about that one. But that is none of your business. That is none of your business. Pastor, how can I love someone who wants to kill me? It is called wisdom. Hallelujah. It is called wisdom. And that is, that is, that is where the, you know, the, 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 the trick lies. Because would I throw myself in the hand of the enemy? Absolutely not. But I say this. I say that. Instead of you, this is what I truly think Jesus was meaning when he said, you know, love your neighbor. Everyone. Including they that are seeking to kill you. Why is that? The point is this. If every 
everything that proceeds out of you, genuinely coming from the heart, that fulfill the mandate of Almighty God. God is mandated to watch over his word in your life. God is mandated to watch over his word to be performed in your life. Why? Because you have come in line with the requirement of the, of, of the word. It is not, you know, what you are dealing with, you yourself cannot fight it. What wants to kill you? It is not something that by your strength you can face them. That is the reason why a man's <coughs> your eyes have to be set on God so that your God can defend you. Every time that sin comes in, you are just tightening God's hands. The Lord cannot move because sin is in the man's life. And it becomes very difficult. Remember the story about that? Uh, this morning we were talking about it, Balaam and Balak. And so the, the secret was that if you want to get them, if you want to break them, if you want to kill them, if you want to finish him, bring him to a point where he will sin against his God. Bring him to a point where he will take his eyes out of God. Bring him to a point where he will not fulfill God's requirement. Then you will get him. Then you will get him. So you can see that it's not about people. It is all about you and your God. It is all about you and your God. That is where you know, compassion become complete. <clears throat> compassion is completed when you start seeing things from that perspective. Oh, this is the one he, she, he, he or she didn't come when I lost a, a, a family member. But you know what? Out of compassion, I would definitely go and show love. It is not your responsibility to judge. Let Almighty God be the judge of the situation. You, your responsibility is to fulfill your godly assignment over your life. And that is where the power is. Every single time, this is the tool that the enemy is using to drag the children of God out of their position of strength so he can hate them. Unforgiveness is a satanic tool. It's a satanic and very powerful satanic tool. The person has done something to you in such a way that you said, over my dead body, I will never forgive you until I go to the grave. Yes, you will go to the grave and God will lock you to hell. Satan has gotten you. He has gotten you. You know why? Because out of the, your, the hardness of your heart, you were thinking it was about, the, no, 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 it was about your own life. Release him. Let him go so that you can go higher level. Release him. Basic principles of love that Satan had blindfolded the people of God. So compassion is not there. They are in the same church. They are criticizing each other. How can unity come to the church and for the church to move forward? God's spirit cannot work in the, you know, a striving environment. He cannot. He cannot. So the church is stagnant backbiting and all kinds of stuff. But we're supposed to be brothers and sisters. The armor of God, the facial is covered, the back is not. We are supposed to be watchers of brothers and sisters' back. But you know what we do? Ham! We backbite them. We are backbiting them. We are gossiping. So you come to church to find out, oh, hey, this one, hey, today, the kente that she was wearing, did you see? Did, you didn't notice it. No, I didn't really see that one. I was seeing the shoe and, and so what? You asked that person what was the word about? The word. Oh, the music that she sang, it was very, very powerful. She has forgotten about the word. But she has everything to say. Unnecessary argument. Unnecessary topics. And we are just doing all this, not knowing that we are bringing the homes down. Why? This is the topic that you are having at your table. Dinner. Dinner. We are dining with gossiping and all kinds of things that, that is not showing love. When your children start rebelling, do you know where they learned it from? From that table. From that table. We never taught you this thing. Yeah, you did, but you didn't know that you were teaching them. These are areas that we have to really, 
you know, because before you start looking onto others, just make sure your home is clean. What is love? Let's get into details. Romans 13, and the verses 8 to 10. So Apostle Paul wrote to the, to the Romans, he said, let me tell you, having love towards one another, this is what it means. He said, oh, no man, anything, but to love one another. For he that loveth, he loveth another had fulfilled the law. How can I have eternal life? Go and fulfill the law. You love, you fulfill the law. For this, that shall not commit adultery. These are the details. These are the t- details of what you must not do. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not covet. This one, this one, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not, everything, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, all, all these things are outwards. Thou shalt not covet. This is the tenth commandment. And this one, this one, when the rich man showed up before Jesus Christ, he said, well, I will follow you everywhere that you go. And I want to have eternal life too. Jesus said the same thing. Obey the commandment. The man said, I have obeyed it since I am young. Then the Lord brought forth the Ten Commandments. Go. Sell all that you have and come and follow me. Sell all that I have and come and follow you. Ha. Huh. Jesus, I wanted to follow you, but, but this one... I will follow this commandment myself. He let go. He cannot. That is, that is because he loved money. He covet. His heart is somewhere else. The treasure is the money, so that's where the heart is. God is not his treasure. It was all outward. Seeing him, I want to follow you. Hey, a man of God who praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Just, but your inner home, from within, you are filthy. This morning we were having a topic about the women in the church. Great institutions saying that, oh, we don't ordain women and all kinds of stuff. I said, hey, let me tell you. John 8, 32. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Anything that I hear that keeps me in bondage is not the truth. Jesus, he lifted women. He lifted up little women. Therefore, don't come and tell me that in the church, women cannot minister. They were. They were supportive. And the Holy Spirit was not outpouring to men only. He outpoured the Holy Spirit to all men, including women. I mean, that's what he did. So do you think that the Holy Spirit is only at work in men? You didn't get it. The law has been moved to a higher level. A higher level. God himself saw it. We're gonna, you know, let's go into details and start seeing these things. So, in verse 10 of Romans 13, he said, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his... Love is not meant to give headache. Love is not meant to give headache. If we come to the basis, a man saying that I love my wife, but the wife can become a punching bag. I love my wife, but the things that you do to that, that woman... Is this part of love? It's not. You don't love God. You do not love God. Because if you do, the expression, your expression of love to God will be seen in your wife, in your children, in your home. You cannot take care of the church of God because your attitude is not someone that, you know, it doesn't qualify you to lead the church. But you let the, the man wounded on the side and run quickly to the church to come and give the message. And I'm very sure that day he was preaching about compassion. Hallelujah. We said that Christ has moved us on a higher level. Romans 8.3 This is the reason why the man ran away with his money. I can't follow you, Jesus. Why is that? He said, For what the Lord could not do, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his his own son 
in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. Condemn sin in the flesh. So you can see that if you are going to look at things from physical perspective only, if you are going to see how you should you know, love people by calculating things from the carnality aspect of things, what they did to you and what they didn't do and how is this and all that, you will not. You will not love nobody. This is the reason why this man came and asked Jesus Christ, who is my neighbor? Can I possibly love the Samaritans? This is what the man was, he wanted to know. Jesus said, let me tell you, if you are not operating in carnality, then you will be able to love anyone. You will be able to love anyone. You will be able to love this husband that you have stood at the church and say, I do. And everybody clap for you. And we started saying, don't know. Don't know. Marriage. Marriage. But a time comes. A time comes. The woman is sick now. And this, this sickness has been going on for a long time. It's your life, it seems like your life has stopped. The up, up and downs of the hospitals. The bills that are coming. The stress and everything else. Let me tell you. That day, probably, you said in sickness and in good health, I do. Today, your faith is being trialed by such a condition. God wants to see how much you love him, not your wife. God wants to see how much you love him. If you love me, take care of my flock. If you love me, take care of my daughter that I have given to you as a wife. Let me see that one. Hey, you know, this whole sickness thing I don't understand. You have become a curse in my life. Since this marriage, I have never, never succeeded in anything. What type of woman are you? Hey, where is the love of God? Where is the love of God? In these situations, you will see. So if you are going to operate by the beauty that you saw in that woman, by the money that you saw in that woman, by the family perspective and the connection and anything else that you saw in that woman, your craftiness of mind, let me hook up with this one. It will be okay with me. Let me tell you, a time has come and it is not okay with you. You're going to have to prove yourself. You're going to have to prove yourself. God will test you in that particular area. God is not mocked. Whatever that your man sows, he will reap it. He will definitely reap it. So if you are going to make decisions by the flesh, you will fall. He said the law, it was weak through the flesh. It was weak through the flesh. So, the law being weak through the flesh, Jesus being sent. We said it. John 1.17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came with Jesus Christ. Jesus came, and on the same level of love, John 13, and the verse is 34 to 35. Look at what Jesus said about love commandment. Jesus said, a new Commandment I gave unto you. A new commandment. A new commandment. A new commandment I gave unto you. That ye love one another. What is new about this? Ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this all men shall know that ye are my disciple. If ye have loved one another. By this all men shall know that ye are my disciple. The disciples of the Lord. They shall be known by their deeds. Hallelujah. By the fruit we shall know them. I thought that you go to church. I thought you go to church. That is the unbeliever saying this things. I thought you go to church. I thought you go to church. Even the unbeliever can testify that your Christianity is not genuine. The guy is testifying that your Christianity is not genuine. That you need to question yourself. That is why he's not coming unless you are inviting him. Jesus Christ cannot give a new commandment without because the Lord has seen it. He saw it in that lawyer's life. He saw it in the young rich, you know, the ruler's life. That the man ran away because he does not have what it takes. 
To leave money aside and follow God. To leave covetousness aside and follow God. So God made the decision to help man. Hallelujah. In other words, we have come to the conclusion to say that love in the flesh will not work. Love operating in the flesh is fake. Love operating in the flesh is lies. Oh, when I see your eyes, I'm melted. It is fake. Every woman will tell you that. It is fake. Even though she's married. <laughs> so interesting. Some of the women are just being melted also because <laughs> men, are, they are very scarce to find now. So I say, okay, let me just, I know he, he's deceiving me, but let me. <laughs> the situation is very tough now. And the men, they know. And they are playing games. They are playing games. But if you wait on the plan of Almighty God, the Lord has somebody prepared for you. Someone who loves Almighty God. And will come and will not love you because of your beauty. But it will be a love that proceeds from within. Because first and foremost, he loves his God. And he will listen to God. A higher level of commandment is given. But this time, are they going to operate or obey the commandment with the laws in Moses? Definitely not. Romans 8.2 He said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. So there is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is the law in Christ Jesus. Christ did not change the commandment without what it takes for a man to obey that commandment. And it was God's will. Hebrews Hebrews chapter 8 and the verses 7 to 9. He said this. He said, for if that first cover, co co covenant, that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them. For finding, it, it wasn't that God's commandment was faulty, but for finding fault with the people. People could not come to God's standard. People could not, they did not have what it takes to come to God's standard. So God said, behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they continue not in my covenant and I regarded them not says the Lord. They couldn't do it. God is going to let it go. I'm going to change it. I'm going to help them. I'm going to help them. This fake love, I'm going to help him by giving him what he takes to really love somebody. So First John chapter 4 and the verses 7 to 8. Let me read 7. He said, you know, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth, you know, loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. It's simple. You want to know if you are a lover of God or you want to know even if you are a Christian. If you are a Christian, this is the answer of your question. If you are wondering if your Christianity is genuine, you can definitely see it through how you fellowship with others. Your relationship with others. You love others. You are born again. And you love God. And you know God. So Hebrews 8. 12 to 13. This is where the whole thing comes to be completed. He said. God himself. Knowing that they, have not, they cannot come up to the standard. He said. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Thank you Lord. And their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember them no more? In that he said. A new covenant. A new covenant. He had made the first old. So there has been a change. Now that which decayed. And was old. Is ready to vanish away. What is he talking about? This is what he's talking about. The righteousness of the law. Is fulfilled in us by the spirit of God. So we need the Holy Spirit. To be able to love genuinely. To 
be able to obey the commandments of Almighty God. To overcome covetousness. It is not something that you can overcome it in the flesh. It would take a spirit man to overcome covetousness. These are things that proceed from within. We can be, you know, in carnality, in the flesh, showing love. Oh, these are flowers. Oh, these are money. Oh, these are this one. But by the time that it is, you know, you are being challenged from genuity of your love. A situation where your husband will be sick, your wife will be sick. What you love so much, physically upon that person is now being decayed. What would you do? What would you do? This is the time that your God wants to see what is really in you. This is the time that one needs grace. We wake up every morning and we say that, oh, how are you? By grace of God, I am swimming in the grace. I am... No, you are not swimming in the grace because you just shouted on that woman. You just shouted on that woman. You close the door angry and you are just going and, and we come there. And, how are you? Hey, by grace of God, grace is not operating for you. It is not. It's not working. So, God said, Romans 8, verse 4 to 6, we are bringing everything to an end. He said, when we operate that way, then we are going to see, when we operate with the Spirit of God, when we are not operating in the flesh, but operating by the Spirit of Almighty God, because the law is weak with the flesh, but mighty through the Spirit. So he said the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Holy Spirit. But after the Holy Spirit. For they that are after the flesh, they do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carnal mind is always working dead works. Carnal mind is always working dead works. So, when a man, a, spiritually in, a spiritual man, a man that is operating by the Spirit of God, do you know how his home is? Peaceful home. Peaceful home. Because he fulfills, you know, when, when what he loves so much in the wife, is now being decayed. Do you know what he sees? He sees God. He sees God. He sees the image of God. He sees the image of God in that woman. He comes to find out that there is a covenant that binds two of them with Almighty God. He remembers that the very moment that God created that woman, the first person that that woman saw was not him, but it was God. So as a result of that, it is his responsibility because one day God is going to ask him, what did you do with the woman that I gave you as a wife? Let me love this woman without any condition, any string attached with everything that has been given up. We used to be very well. Today, things are tough. Will you still stay with that woman? Or maybe someone is just trying to attract you with money. And you are ready to let the children with the woman and just move out. What is your understanding of, 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 of you loving God? It is easy to love God. It is very easy. May the Lord God help us. May the Lord God help us. This is Hebrews. The word of the living God to our lives. He said, let brotherly love continue. I have come today to tell you that God said, let brotherly love continue. Please continue in the love, loving each other, one another. That is how we come to say that we love God. And I know that as we are doing that, the Lord church shall be increased unto his glory. Your life shall be increased unto his glory. Your home shall be increased unto, your glory, unto his glory. Your children shall be increased unto his glory. And your life shall be perfected because Jesus Christ is bringing forth that perfection over your life. What he did on the Calvary, it was for you and for me. To him alone be the glory. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. We have a word of the Lord and we title it Love Perfected Through Calvary and Pentecost. Love Perfected Through Calvary and Pentecost.
Pentecost. You see, when you hear the word Calvary, it talks about the passion of Christ. You hear Calvary, you are thinking of the passion of Christ. And when you hear Pentecost, you are thinking of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, God is love. And God loves us so much. God is love. And God love he loves us so much and most of the time we are always saying that we love god we love god oh lord how much i love you god how much i love you how great you are to me how wonderful how good you are to me but you know the thing is this it is when we see the goodness of god in our lives that we say we love god by the time that we start going through trials and tribulations or the time of faith that is being tried, now our minds or our faith is coming down and we wonder if we truly love the Lord. You know, what we say to God, it is only in time of trial that the Lord God will truly know if you love him or not. It is very easy to say you love God when everything is fine. It is very easy to say you love God when things are going smoothly. But the moment that things are hard, you pray and the prayers are not being answered. You are not seeing the manifestations of the things that you ask God for. And you start wavering in faith and your mind towards God is being change the lord god is love and he wants us to dwell in his love love perfected through calvary and pentecost first john chapter 4 and the verse is 7 17 to 19 first john chapter 4 verse 17 to 19 here is the word. The Lord says, Herein is our love made perfect. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loveth. We love him because he first loveth. We love him because he first loveth. It will only be testified or verified at the day of your trial. When your faith is being tested, this is the day that you will truly say, if you love the Lord. Our love is made perfect. And when we are walking in the perfection of love, your heart is not being condemned. And this is something that is going to be justified in the day of judgment but you don't wait till that day for what to verify it as we are living every single day our relationship with the lord the way that we relate to god should testify that indeed god loves us and we love him that much so as disciples of the lord this is not something that is a commandment it's a commandment God commanded us. Jesus Christ made a statement in John 13 and the verses 34 to 35. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one 
another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So if you are a disciple of the Lord, not only you are loving God, but you are also loving a brother and a sister. And this is a commandment. This is a commandment from the Lord. So, love is so large and extremely general. But love is something that is internal. Internal that is going to be manifested. But it is not the manifestation of what you have planned to do. It is about the genuineness of what is inside. Because we have seen the situations that people br were bringing that much to God. But the heart is completely far from him. In other words, you can decide to do so much just to impress people. You can decide to just portray so much out there for people to see that this is what you are doing in the house of God. But it is for your own glory. It is for your own glory. The love that is genuine is the love that is internal, that is really vibrating unto the glory of the living God. People will not and they will not know the insight and the measure of that love until the Lord God confirms it. Until the Lord God confirms it. So much are being done from one to another. But it is not out of genuine love. Some of them they are out of friendship. Some are out of tradition. Some are out of culture. But the love that is internal that comes from God. Is a love that turns back to you because it is going to testify and help you to be bold for your day of judgment. So whatsoever that you are doing for anyone according to the law that, is, that pertains to the kingdom of God, it is for yourself. You do it to them because the Lord God told you that this is your nature. And if that nature is, is, is of God, truly, you don't struggle to love. You do not struggle to love. To love God and to love people. John 17, the verse is 20 to 23. The word of God says, and this particular scripture here is when Jesus Christ was being glorified. In other words, he was going to be taken up. So the Lord was leaving the disciples and then he prayed a prayer for these disciples. How important this prayer was. The Lord said. Neither pray I for this alone. Said I'm not praying for the disciples alone. But for them also. Which shall believe on me. Through their word. For them also which shall believe on me. Through the word of those disciples. That they all may be one. As thou father are in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You see, it is such a powerful scripture. Because the end of it all is that they may know that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So the father loved, you know, he loves as, as much as he loves the son. God Almighty loves us as much as he loves Jesus Christ. And this is very, very important because it means that if the love that we have from the Father is the same 
as the love that the father has for the son what you testify of what the father did for jesus christ the lord god is able to do the same thing for you god is going to do the same thing for you and probably greater because jesus confirmed that he is going to be with the father on the right hand of the father the things that he did you are also going to do the same thing and greater thing that you are going to do because he is with the father the father loves us as much as he loves the son and it is important for us to know this it is out of love that people will know that we are the disciples of our lord jesus christ it is out of love the way that we relate to each other how we care for each other not trying to impress anyone but genuine love that we express to one another and this is how the world will know that we are the children of god so you can see that there is a separation between the people of the world and the people that pertain to the kingdom of god what makes the people of the kingdom of god children of god is love and this love is expressed by fellowship by fellowship so when we fellowship with one another that is how the world knows that we are the children of god in fellowship we are brothers and sisters keepers in fellowship we are brothers and sisters watches we pray for them we feel when they are going through situations we stand when they are in pain we stand with them we make sure that what we don't want anybody to do to us we are not doing those things either to them in fellowship trinity the father son and the holy spirit work together and one and brought us also in there to join them to become one as the father is in the son so is the son in the father and the son also in us as we are in him so at the end of the day we have come from far to join such a wonderful group united by entity called love we stand on this love to do every single thing that the lord god has called us to do pertaining his kingdom in this world here this is the foundation of our fellowship from one to another you see when you see people in love you will not see where they come from when you see people in love you will not see that they speak a different language when you see people in the love of god you will see them as yourself that is what the lord god is trying to tell us you know second peter chapter 1 and the verse is 3 to 10. the word of god say he says according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness so the life that we have it is given according to the power of god the life that we live we are living according to the power of god you know i am not surprised in john 17 that we just read about the prayer of jesus christ jesus made a statement he said that father i am coming the ones that you have given me when i was here with them i care for them now that i'm coming lord i pray that you watch over them against the evil one the world is evil this place we are here but we are not from here and for one to be able to live in the midst of an evil world it will take power from above to keep you going every single day so when the word of god tells us that you know we waking up up and down early in the morning and strengthen and nobody is sick and everybody is well you have to know it is because there is a power from above that wakes you up there is a power from above 
that allowed your children to be strengthened and moving around and going up and down without nothing happening to you. The Lord God is a powerful God and his mercies are constantly at work in our lives. Mm. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that had called us unto glory and virtue. You see that? Through the knowledge of Christ that have called us unto glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of the Father that had called us unto glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might know. He said by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. My goodness. You have to see what the word is telling us here. He said that once we have the knowledge of God, this knowledge of God, it is something that we receive to bring us unto glory. That has been purposed by the Father and the Son to give us and through that, we have received precious promises. And these promises have been, have been manifested. And the manifestations of the promises of God, precious, great and precious promises of God, had brought us to a point where we have escaped the corruption in the world. We have escaped the corruption in the world. In other words, every single thing that is killing people in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eye, the pride of life, and all that, you see, the promises, the great and exceeding promises of God had pulled us out, and we have escaped that corruption because the Lord called it corruption. So the world is corrupt, and the people that are in the world enjoying the world are corrupt and the lord tells us that as far as you are concerned you have been pulled out so it is important for one to understand that i used to be there but i'm no more there lord god has pulled me out of a state of corruption i am no more corrupt by the things of the world therefore i am careful how i relate to the world And he said, verse 5 of 2 Peter 1, he said, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. You see that? Beside this, giving all diligence, you have to add to your faith. You have to add to what keeps you going, virtue. The virtue that we are talking about here is the conscious life of God, presently living every moment of your life. In other words, you are someone who will wake up in the morning and whatever that you have planned to do, whatever that you are going to do, you are conscious about the power that keeps you going. The power that keeps you going. There are certain things that you will not do when they come on your way because you are a child of God. You are ruled by rules and regulations. So that is what makes you who you are. And the power that keeps you going, the fellowship is towards the Father and the Son. You are conscious about it. I am a child of God and I will not yield myself into this type of situation because this is from the world that is corrupt. And it is something that you have to add to your faith. Virtue. Virtue. And to virtue, you have to add knowledge. You see, as you are conscious of God in your every single day life, you have to seek to know more of God. You have to seek to know more of God. And to knowledge, temperance, you see, being able to measure. Because you know, so you know when to come in and when to restrain yourself. Temperance, you see. And to temperance, 
patience. Hallelujah. To temperance, patience. You see, we are not, we are careful in what we speak. We don't just rush and do things because the kingdom of God, where we belong to, things are done in orderly manner and we are moved by the spirit of God. If it is not God's will, we will not move in there and do anything. You see, so the faith that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ brought us a conscious of life that is towards God in every single thing that we do. Our relationship with people is constantly being regulated by the commandments or where we belong to the commandments of Christ. And not only that, we continue seeking for more knowledge in our Lord Jesus Christ so more knowledge we have, it will give us temperance. Temperance. And in temperance, we are patient in how God is moving. We are not moving too fast. We don't lead the Spirit of God, but we allow the Spirit of God to what? To lead us. These things are so important. You have to add these things to your faith. You have to add these things to your faith. And to patience, godliness. To patience, Godliness. Could you possibly be serving God in patience? Could you possibly be serving God in patience? You have prayed a prayer, but you have not received the answer yet. Are you patient enough to wait upon the Lord? For the Lord to open that door at his appointed time. Or you will just move ahead and say that I have prayed about it. So let me go and do what I have prayed about. You see, if you allow God to do it, it is completely different. It's going to be different from you. Have prayed about it and you have gone to do it without hearing from God. From God. So, these are the characteristics of a child of God that is moving by the Spirit of God. So, to your temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness. To patience, godliness. In the conscious of the things of God and to godliness brotherly kindness hallelujah into godliness brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness charity which is called love you see that brotherly kindness to godliness brotherly kindness the order is important you know why the order is important because he said to godliness you have to add brotherly kindness. In other words, you cannot tell someone that you love the person when you don't love God. And it vice versa. You cannot go before the Lord and say, Lord, I love you so much. When you cannot love your wife, you cannot love your husband, you cannot love your children, you cannot love a colleague, you can't love nobody. It is impossible. So, it is our surrounding, the world that we live in. You see, the kingdom that pertains to God is a domain that is being ruled by the regulations of God. The laws of God. He said Romans 8.2 talks about, he said, for the spirit of God, it is the spirit of the law that is in Christ Jesus, has set me free from the spirit of the what? Of the, from the law of sin and death. From the law of sin and death. It is the law in Christ Jesus. So we are ruled by the law in Christ Jesus. So if I'm saying that I belong to our Lord Jesus Christ, that I believe in Christ, it will be seen in my fellowship to people, genuinely. And I'm not doing this to please them. I'm doing this because this is my nature. You see that? It makes a whole difference. If you know God, because knowledge is part of our virtues that we have to be added. If you know God, then you are very much careful in the way that you do your things. And you are also patient waiting on God's time. And not only that, you are conscious about the things that the Lord God has planned for your life. And you are waiting, moving right with God. And as you are moving right with God, everyone that comes on your way, you see that person in the perspective of the plan of Almighty God. You relate to them in love, brotherly kindness, sisterly kindness. You relate to them in, 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 you know, in love because you know that 
this person cannot come to my life if the Lord God has not allowed the person to come in. So the moment that we live our lives in the consciousness of God's purpose, God's plan for our life, every single thing that comes on our way, we see that thing from the perspective of God. All things work together for good for them that love God and who are called according to what? According to his purpose. All things. So whatsoever that comes, it is not about what is coming. It is about my stand to confront what is coming. But my relationship to whatever that is coming is all love. And the love that pertains to God. Christ loved us because the Father loves him. And he also loves the Father. And he said that the Father loves us as much as the Father loves him, Jesus Christ. We stand on the arena of power. We stand on the arena of power. There is nothing that no one is going to do to you that will affect you to bring you down. Except the Lord God allows it. Except God allows it. And to stand in this faith, such a great faith, you have to be conscious about every single thing that we have been saying here. Standing right with our God. Mm. Godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity, which is love. Then verse 8 of Second Peter 1, he said, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? If you are conscious about God. You are not going to be barren. And unfruitful. In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that more you know of Christ. More concurrent you are. More you know of Christ. More power you receive to live. Closer you are to Christ, greater assignment that you are going to be accomplished for the purpose of God. He said, if you are living in the consciousness of God, it will bring you more knowledge. You will be seeking to know more. You will be seeking to know more and more. He said, barrenness. But barren from the knowledge of God or unfruitful, unfruit, unfruitfulness from the knowledge of God. People that are without it, they don't receive it. Please understand these things. Unto you, it is given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But unto them, you speak to them in parables because they are without it. More closer you are, more secret or mysteries of the kingdom are being opened to you. This is it. If you are thirsty, come to the living water and drink. But if you come with a spoon, you can only take the spoon size to drink. If you come with a container, you will be taking a container size to drink. So as much as you want, it is there. Draw yourself closer and get more and more. Barrenness in the knowledge of God, unfruitfulness in the knowledge of God is extremely destructive. This is the reason why people and you know start driving and just enter into accidents. They will just wake up and someone will just come on their way, scatter the whole day. Why? Because these things are not in place. The Lord God, who is in business of opening his people's eyes, is always always making sure that these things are working in your life. So, verse 9, he said that he that lacketh these things is blind. You see that? He that lacketh the knowledge of God is blind and cannot see afar. Cannot see afar off. It is your knowledge of God that will allow you to receive the revelations necessary to move forward. You are moving, you don't know what is awaiting for you. 
Because you did not spend enough time to seek that knowledge from God. Are you the type that hears somebody's promotion and you are grieved? Are you the type when you see someone fall and you take joy? Then you come to Sunday and start praising God and all that. It's all in vain. This one, you don't need anybody from nowhere to come and tell you these things. Because it is something that is within. You can lie to anybody that you want outside you. But the moment that you lie to yourself, you know that you are lying to yourself. Which means that you cannot lie to yourself. And if a man comes to a point to lie to himself, that person's case is closed. Person's case is closed. So, it is easy to say, oh, I love you and all that. You know what? It, is, it will be seen by God. When you say, God, I love you. The Lord will see it when God sent Samuel to go to Jesse's house and anoint David. Samuel didn't know who he was going to anoint. So he saw, he saw Eliab, the older son. And then Samuel said that, indeed, this is the anointed of God. God spoke to Samuel. He said that, Samuel, <laughs> I am not a man. I am God. I don't see the way that a man sees. I, God, I see the heart of a man. A man sees the outward things, but God sees the heart. So the outward things that you are doing, people will see this and say, that, oh, this person is so good. He's slow, lovely, and kind, and all that. But God will see the heart that is doing those things. Hallelujah. This is how we know that truly we love our God. How far can you go for a brother? How far can you go for a sister in love? You know, there is a story in Luke 11, 5 to 13. I'm going to read it quickly. The word of God says, he said, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight? So you have a friend that come to you at midnight. Midnight. And say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. So your friend came at midnight. You were sleeping. And he said that, I need bread. I need bread. The reason why I need this bread, verse 6, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me. So you can see, already we have three people that are involved. Okay? We have one person that went and see another friend. And he told the friend, you know what? I need some bread from you because I have a friend that just came in. I have a friend that just came in. He was not asking the bread for himself. He was asking for this bread for a friend who has come to him. Mm. He said, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me and I have nothing to set before him. I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not, trouble me not. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Let me explain this. The man that came and asked his friend, the bread, it was not for him. It was for a friend that had come in the middle of the night. And he himself doesn't have anything to give to this friend that just came from the journey. So he doesn't have what he did. Why is it that he's not telling now the one that just came? After all, midnight. It's late. Everything. He said the children are sleeping. The wife is sleeping. Everybody is sleeping in the house. The door was shut. It is understandable. That friend who just came in will understand that he came late. The only thing that this friend can do, he said, that, okay, don't worry. Let me have a place for you to sleep. Go sleep. No water, no food. Tomorrow morning, don't worry, we will take care of you. He didn't do that. What he did is that he was looking to see if this man has been eaten. He didn't even ask him. The next thing he did, he stood. 
He doesn't have what he wants to do. I want to do good to this man, but I don't have what it takes to do good. But one thing that I have, that which I will give. I will stand up and go and knock at midnight another friend's door. And as I knocked the, the door, the friend told me, could, could have told me, go away, I'm sleeping with my children. I cannot. He said, I will continue knocking. And because I am a friend, he will stand up, open that door, and give me as much as I needed from him. As much as I needed from him. This is the scenario of how God sees the brotherly kindness. Brotherly, in your godliness, add brotherly kindness. This is how far it goes. Mm. Verse 10 of Luke 11. He said, For everyone that asks, received. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knock, it shall be opened. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Hallelujah. He said, let me tell you one thing. I am almighty God. And the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love. Genuine love. He said, if me being a heavenly father to you, what is it that you will ask me that I cannot do? For your earthly parents, when you ask them bread, they don't give you stones. They give you bread. And they are doing this out of love. So it is. To me, the heavenly father pertaining to the things of the, my kingdom. Anyone that is thirsty, come to the stream of the water. Come and drink. Come and drink. You have to ask because it's the kingdom principle. Nobody is coming to set things at your table. You have to come and ask for it. Say, how much more will I give the Holy Spirit to them that ask for? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father to everyone and each one of us. You cannot love outside the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit that caused the nature of God in us. It is the Holy Spirit that causes the nature of God in us. Love is of God because God is love. And the Lord God created man in his own image and likeness. In the nature of the Adamic, there is no love. That is why you see husbands and wives blaming each other. Because Adam did not stop to tell even God that it is the woman that you gave me. Who made me fall? People are standing against one another and blaming one another. Contention in the houses because they are still in the world that is what corrupt. They have forgotten that the Lord God has pulled them out of that place. Your nature now is a divine nature. You have been regenerated by our Lord Jesus Christ. Which means that the Holy Ghost has pulled you out of the world of sin. And has brought you to the kingdom of God. And you have to live exercising that power in your life. Your every single day life. You cannot express love because you are angry within. You cannot express love because there are some things within you that are eating you up. But if you have come to the point to see God as your Alpha and Omega, to see Jesus Christ as your heavenly provider, not earthly provider, earthly provider might run out of resource, but the heavenly provider, the maker of it all, it is through him that all things come to existence. So if it's not there, he will create it for your sake, out of love. The moment that our minds are settled on these things, 
You see, we don't move around begging, but we move in love. We move in love. The one that loves you will not allow these things to happen to you to make you fall. Your heavenly father that gives you the Holy Spirit when we ask him. It is very, very true. He made a promise and the promise came to pass in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, the verse is 1. Acts 2, let me read from 1 to 12. You know, something happened in Acts 2. Last week we talked about the day of Pentecost. You see, he said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and the Spirit gave them utterance to speak. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Look at this. Out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was announced abroad, the multitude came together. So, when it was known what had taken place, when it was known the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, many that were around, they all came closer to them. The multitude came together and were confounded because that every, every man heard them speak in their own language. Every man, multitude came together when they have heard about what was going on. They came together and every man that came to that place heard them speak in their own language. They were speaking different languages from different places. But when they came together, knowing what was taking, taking place, everybody was hearing them in their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? Mm. Wherein we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontius and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the part of Libya, and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in their own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Let me explain this. The day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it was so strong and so powerful. And they were being led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit was giving them offerings. And they were speaking. It was brought around what has been taking place. Multitudes started coming. And when they came, they were from Egypt. They were from Crete. They were from Mesopotamia. They were from different places, different nations with different languages. They do not speak Hebrews. But because of the work of the Holy Spirit, they that speak foreign languages could hear in their own language what an, a Jew was talking in Jew language. It's like somebody who doesn't speak your language. And you are speaking to that person in your language. And the person is hearing it in his own language. Automatic translation. Automatic translation. This is what the Spirit of God did in the day of Pentecost. 
You are an African that doesn't speak English in your own dialect. When an Englishman is speaking, you will hear him speaking in your dialect. They were so amazed. They said, my goodness, what is this? What does it mean? What has been taking place? <laughs> it was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For what purpose? Love. Love. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. You see, the Holy Spirit of God is a spirit that breaks barrier. The Holy Spirit of God is a spirit that breaks every language barrier, every doctrine, every... Only one thing that he is concerned of, what is of God. In the kingdom of God, there is no Jew, there is no Egyptian, there is no whatever. They are all one. And there is the spirit of God. The spirit of God. So if you start living your life and seeing things pertaining to the kingdom from God's perspective, you see somebody coming from a different country, someone from a different culture, someone speaking a different language, it will not be a barrier to you for the fellowship. Why? Because the spirit that dwells in you is the same spirit that is also dwelling in the person. So physically, it's not about the language that you are speaking that the person could not hear. But it's about the spirit that brings forth the fellowship. Hallelujah. This is how our hearts need to be open and embraced. People from all nations. People of all languages. And be able, you know, do you know that when someone is speaking a language that you don't understand, it is extremely uncomfortable because you don't know what the person is saying. You might even think that that person is insulting you. But you know what? When we have come, when we are brother, brothers and sisters, we express that brotherly love because the nature of the person cannot allow that person to talk bad of you. So the moment that you start using your language, that pertain to your nation as a tool against somebody that is not familiar with it you are not of God you are not of God it's a kingdom that all nations are brought leave those things in the hand of God it is the Holy Spirit that was doing the translation no one else allow God to work in that person's life you don't know what this person has been given for <laughs> for your ministry it's just a matter of time give that person time exercise patience continue praying for the person at the appointed time you will see the pearls of gold coming out of this person and it will be done by God God despise not because he is almighty God and in control of all mm. what does this mean it means you have to remember where you are coming from. Ephesians chapter 2 and the verse is 11 to 18. And we are bringing everything to an end. It means you have to remember where you are coming from. The word says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, mm, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Simple. This is where we are coming from. What is the meaning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? What is the meaning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? The meaning is that you used to be in a world that was completely corrupt. God Almighty in his unfailing love pulled you out. 
you who were without God, we who were without God, today the Lord God had brought us to listen to his word. We were aliens, strangers of the commonwealth of Israel. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twin one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were near. For through him we have both access by one spirit unto the Father. You see, long scripture that is simply saying that you and I, we used to be that far. But today, by the Spirit of God, the Lord God has brought a sneer. The one that sacrificed himself, he sacrificed himself so that we can come to be one. Unity in the church. Unity in fellowship. Unity in the child of God. Unity in your homes, your marriages, your families. It is essential because that is how we know that you are children of Almighty God. May the Lord God bless you. May the Lord bless his word in your life. May the Lord empower you to live a godly life. May the Lord strengthen you and bring forth the love that he has implanted in you. Live according to the ordinances, the rules and the regulations of Almighty God. Your life will never ever be the same. Your home will never, never be the same. Your marriage will never, never be the same. There is nothing that will stop you. For Almighty God has given you that power to live a glorious life unto his glory. May the Lord God bless you, bless your children, bless your family, bless your ministry unto his glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you. We bless the name of the living God for your lives. And we thank God for his mercies over everyone and each one of you. Today, we have a word from the Lord that we titled, Believer's Level of Power. Believer's Level of Power. So, God gives power to his children. But what measure of power do you have or do I have? This is what we are going to talk about today. So the book of Luke chapter 9 and the verses 40 to 43. There is an account here that is going to explain the levels of power. A man came with his son for deliverance. And this was in the very presence of Jesus Christ. As we are in the presence of our Lord Jesus today, the 12 disciples were also around, working directly with Jesus. This man came with a son and asked them, the disciples, for help. And he was not satisfied with what happened. So he came to Jesus and told Jesus, Christ, Jesus, I came to this place and I besought thy disciple to cast the devil out of my son and they could not. So you can see right away that the man was saying something deep. My son was possessed with an unclean spirit. 
tormenting his life. And I know that this is a place of power. Because Jesus, I have heard thy testimony. I know that you are the one and the only one that is going to deliver this, my son. But I'm having an issue here. Because when I brought this son to your disciples, they couldn't do much concerning his situation. So Jesus answered the man. He said, oh, in the form of talking to everyone, especially to his disciples, he said, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. How long shall I be with you and suffer you? Ah, uh, man, please, bring your son. Bring the possessed son. Bring the sick son. So, the man brought the son. And as the son was coming, the devil threw him down and told him, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him to his father. And everybody around, they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. Hallelujah. If this man had encounter with the disciples alone, he could have gone home with a sick son, with a sick child, without deliverance. Without deliverance. If you continue the story, Jesus Christ is going to say so many things because as they depart from the public place, the disciples will ask Jesus, Jesus, how is it that we have been moving around, casting out demons and all that, working great? The man who brought the son knew that the disciples could do something about the son. That is why he took the child to them. But unfortunately, it was above their power. So the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, what is it that we couldn't cast the demon out? Uh, Jesus said, there are levels of powers. There are levels of powers. Because he said, faithless generations. So levels of faith. Levels of faith. That is exactly what we are going to talk about today. What are the levels of power for the believer? The levels of power for the believer. This story, Jesus answered them. He said, uh, some of them, it takes prayer and fasting. Some of these demons cannot just cast them out like that. You have to have certain level of power to be dealing with certain kind. So there are situations that your strength might be able to overcome it. But there are other situations that you might not. So as a believer, that is why we are bringing this message today so that, you know, you get to be, you know, you get to know about it and work for a higher level of authority, power, and all that. So that you will be able to deal with every single situation that the devil will bring on your way. This is why. It is also to challenge ourselves. Examination in schools, they are meant to test your level. So, and we also know that 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he said there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? God will not allow anything that you cannot handle to come to you. There is a level of power. So according to your power, so shall the level of temptation comes to you. These things are wonderful spiritual principles. You want to live a life of overcomer, 
then you definitely want to go on a higher level with your gold. Because apparently, it is not like devil is more powerful than God. Absolutely not. And the Lord God wants us to have power to overcome the works of the devil. So, when the disciples could not cast that devil out, that doesn't mean that they didn't have power. They have power, but they have certain level of power. Jesus said, the type of faith you have doesn't match to cast out that devil. We are going to talk about four levels. Four levels of power. Number one, it is called delegated spiritual authority. Delegated spiritual authority. This level of power is not resident in the operator. In other words, it is not something that you have absolute control of it. It is not, you know, resident in you. It is God. It is God. And that is one area that we have to be careful because, you see, a lot of fake stuff are going on. It is God that is at work. The power, it is of God. The power, it is of God. If you read the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 4 and the verse 7, you're going to find out that God said, what is it that you have that has not been given? So if it's given, why are you boasting of what you have received? It's God. What we have, it is from God. And if it is from God, it is activated by God. It is activated by God. It is not something that some of them, they will just come and, and start faking around. No, it is God. So, if it is not resident in you, but you are the operator, so you are just a vessel in the hand of Almighty God. You depend on the Holy Spirit of the Lord to operate because God is definitely going to channel this power into you to overcome the situation. But we thank God it is not your strength. It is the strength from above using you as the vessel. Hallelujah. This is wonderful. First level, it is only delegated to you, but it belongs to Almighty God. The book of Mark, Mark 16 and the verses 17 to 18. Jesus Christ brought forth such an amazing explanation. He said, you, believers, disciples, these signs shall follow them that believe. So signs meaning power shall follow them that believe shall follow the believers but not in your strength but in the name of Jesus Christ they shall cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues and take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hallelujah. This is power. This is power. Signs follow them that believe in Jesus Christ. And he said, in my name, in my name, not like the sons of Sivas saying, in the name of the God that Paul preached, Jesus has to be your Jesus. God has to be your God. Because Almighty God holds that power. But the Lord's power works, you know, through his vessels. So you are a mighty vessel in the hand of Almighty God. What is it that God cannot use you to do? Signs shall follow them that believe. Now you watch. In my name, devils 
will be subdued. They will speak mysteries, tongues, we will talk about it, but heavenly language will proceed out of their mouths. That devil will not understand. They will pick up serpent. So picking up serpent is picking up against the devils. Going after the works of darkness. They said, ah, is it not Jesus? The brothers and sisters are just right here with us. How come that this man that we have seen him growing up, doing such wonderful and mighty signs and wonders, how is it possible? The man was operating from, from above. Power from the father using him as his mighty vessel. This is the reason I did or what I do. You can also do it. And greater that you are going to do because I am going on the right hand of my father. And I'm going to impact greater power through you. By the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. You are a vessel in the hand of God. You want to raise the dead. If it's God's will, the Lord can channel that power through you. Your child is sick. Pray for that child. Because if it's God's will, Almighty God can channel through you the necessary power for that child to recover. He said, the believer, you lay hands, the sick shall recover. Shall recover. They try to poison you. It will not work because God said that because of the power, the Lord sees everything that anyone is doing. Every craftiness of the devil against the people of God, the Lord sees it all. He sees it all. So, how are we receiving this power? How can you operate in this delegated spiritual authority? The first level of power. Uh, this power, it is usually, usually given because of the relationship that we have with the owner of the power. Uh, the relationship that you have with the owner of the power. That is how it is given. For we believers, it is important to know that this level of power, as soon as one is born again, certain amount of spiritual power is automatically released. And this is one of them. You are automatically disposed. You know, God just impacts he deposits this power in you as soon as you become born again. So, you who they thought was nobody, you start treading upon the serpent and the scorpions and taking harmful things without harming you. Because somebody is watching over your life. Someone is watching over your life. People say, I, I was trying to kill him. I poisoned this food. He ate it. How come that he's not dead? You cannot be dead because you yourself is you are the embodiment of the vessel of Almighty God. The power. So what they put in you to kill you. The power that is also deposited in you had already neutralized it. This is not something that the enemy knows. They see you, they see you just like that. They said, oh, no, this one, don't worry. I will get you. They cannot get you. They cannot get you. They can't. So, good news. Every believer has that delegated authority. Praise the Lord. And this one, good news because you did not pay a dime for it. Not even single little amount of money. You receive it freely at salvation. That's right there. God gives it to you. So, please, at this level, 
remember that you are not empty as they think you are. This has nothing to do with your feelings. It has nothing to do with your feelings. Either you believe it or you don't believe it. It is something that God has done. Either you think you have it or you don't have it. I'm telling you, you have it. You do. And if they want to see if you have it, let them come. They will find out that you have it. Because God said so. So, but this level of power, the delegated spiritual authority, it is the lowest energy level in Christian life. Lowest energy level in Christian life. And you have to know that authority is different from power. Authority is different from what? From power. Let me give an example so that you can really see the difference between the two. Let's see a policeman. Matter of fact, this one is not even a tall policeman. He's a very short policeman, but he's a policeman. He stays in the middle of the road to direct traffic. And you will see very huge truck coming with the driver coming in full speed. Full speed, that is what? Power. The little Ricky Kill policeman that is standing just right there. As soon as that policeman raised his hands like this, hey, you will stop. That is authority. The truck driver has power. The truck has power. But the policeman has what? Authority. So there is difference between power and authority. Watch this. Luke 4 and the verse is 36. Everybody was amazed. And they spoke among themselves saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power, Jesus commanded the unclean spirit and they obey him and come out. May you crave to have authority and power in the name of Jesus. Well, we said there is, a, there is difference between the two. And it is also dependent on the relationship that we have with the Father. But we said that automatically as soon as you are born again, you receive it. But if your relationship is going down with God, do you think that you'll be able to operate that much? We said that this is not something that is resident in you. It's not yours. God is the one that releases it within you at its will. So if you decide to backslide, you decide, you just said that, you know what, this whole Christianity thing, eh, you're also going to come down in the power. You will come down. Ah! I used to cast out devils, but today devils are casting me out. You have to know something has gone wrong. So, today, the vast majority of Christians are operating at this level of power. You have to be willing to come up higher. Hallelujah. That is the first level. We are moving to the second level of power. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 and the verse is 8. This second level of power is called the Holy Ghost power. Holy Ghost power. He said when, he, when Holy Ghost comes, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea, in Samaria and unto all uttermost part of the earth. Holy Ghost. Power. 
when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is a difference between baptism in the water and baptism in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so, water baptism is different from Holy Ghost baptism. So, when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you get something that is higher than the delegated spiritual authority. You get something that is higher than the first level of power. So, a Christian that is not filled with Holy Ghost is lacking something. A Christian that is not filled with Holy Ghost, you are lacking much. And when Holy Ghost comes also, you know, you start speaking in tongues. You start speaking in tongues. Tongues. Do you know that tongues, as we speak by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, it will take the empowerment